All right, thanks. Everybody is getting in now. All right, everybody. Um, thank you uh, so much for joining this Clean Energy Town Hall today. I'm not. I'm Jen Walling. I'm the Executive Director of the Illinois Environmental Council. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Gavin Tabes, who is our energy staffer, who's going to lead most of this. But I just wanted to um, introduce this and give a little more information about why we're, we're doing these town halls. Um, I know that one of our big bills right now is the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Um, and uh, there's so much more to energy just than that bill. I know we'll take some feedback on that, but we're going to give some short presentations um, from various experts that are affiliate members of IEC. We have now over 100 affiliate members, um, and they're gonna give some short presentations on our status of where we're at. And then this really is taking public comment from people to help us make decisions about what we're prior going to prioritize in the coming year. So um, after everybody's done talking, we will go 90 minutes to two hours of whatever anybody wants to get out. We wanna make sure we hear from everybody. Um, feel free to type things in the chat. We'll collect feedback afterward. We're going to continue to collect feedback, but we really just want your public comments. You're also welcome to ask questions to the presenters, but we'd really like to hear your feedback on what we should be working on, um, which is why we're having these town halls. And um, we're really thankful for folks for the robust participation. And like I said, we'll continue to collect um, items, but I really want to um, pass it off to Gavin, but also thank you to Tanisha Harris, uh, who the Clean Jobs Coalition Administrator, who um, is uh, doing the tech for today's presentation. So with that, I will pass it off to Gavin, but I'll be here during the event. Thanks so much, Jen. I uh, appreciate it. Yes, thank you to everybody for uh, joining our town hall today. And also a special shout out to um, one of our interns, Micaiah, for taking notes and recording all the very valuable uh, public comments that um, we'll be collecting. So I'm going to quickly share my screen so we can kick this off. All right, can folks see that? Is that okay? Awesome. Great, well again, uh, welcome everybody to um, our Energy Town Hall today. My name is Gavin Tabes. I'm the Energy Policy Director here at the Illinois Environmental Council. Um, so I'm gonna go through um, the agenda for today, uh, who will be speaking in the beginning, and then some uh, just overall context for how people can provide public comments um, and, and share their input. So, uh, for the agenda today, I'm gonna to do a quick introduction to this event. Uh, Jen just gave a, gave a great interview, so um, really appreciate that. And then provide an overview of the IEC energy agenda and some of the progress we've made. Then we'll do a transition into the panel presentations. We have a really, really excellent panel today. Uh, Jenny Castle from Earth Justice is here. We have John Delury, uh, Anne McKibben, uh, and Naomi Davis from Blacks and Green. Um, and you can see the uh, organizations that each of those um, participants is um, working for uh, here on the screen. After that, we're gonna open up a public comment period and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail later on. Um, and there's various ways you can leave public comments for IEC. And then we're gonna, the, don't pay attention to the conclusion of the event at 2 p.m. We're gonna go beyond that uh, to make sure that everybody has um, uh, equal opportunity to provide their comments for us. So first, I'd like to dive in a little bit uh, into the 2019-2020 IEC energy agenda and some of the progress we've made. So first, and I think a lot of people on this call already know, um, really our key energy legislation, the key advocacy that IEC has been engaged in um, surrounds the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Uh, I have the bill numbers here for those who would like to check them out themselves. Um, so the summary of the Clean Energy Jobs Act, which we call CJA for those who don't know, is to essentially end fossil fuel generation in Illinois by 2030, provide 100% um, renewable energy by 2050, and then to meaningfully include environmental justice and frontline communities in the transition towards a renewable energy um, economy. The status right now is that the bill has not yet passed. There was an abbreviated session this spring due to the COVID uh, pandemic, but however, we are aiming for a fall veto session. 
Next, one of our other key uh, legislative priorities was the was HB 4148, which was um, a bill aimed at uh, easing um, electric vehicle charging uh, in condos, uh, and this is uh, targeted at homeowners associations. Um, yeah, so the summary here is that it would break down barriers for electric vehicle charging um, in condos, and it did not pass again due to the abbreviated session. You're going to catch a little bit of a trend here, uh, but we are aiming for uh, the 2021 legislative um, session. Third, there is a suite of bills uh, that IEC was working to pass. Um, these are collectively called the Solar uh, Bill of Rights. Um, that's HB 4068, which was uh, solar for condo owners, easing again the um, ability for condo owners to put solar panels on their properties. There's HB 4069, which was uh, property tax support. And there were um, several others, including preventing local barriers from um, renewable energy development. And then the uh, HB 5105, which is the right to self-generate. The status of all of these bills, collectively the Solar Bill of Rights, is that uh, they did not pass again due to the abbreviated session, but we are aiming for 2021. And fourth, and which was a, a really, really important initiative that IEC undertook alongside many of our partners, including um, a lot of really excellent um, and important work from our environmental justice and frontline community partners, um, we were uh, advocating for a lot of COVID related energy relief. And uh, we were able to successfully advocate for a moratorium on utility shutoffs and a suite of other relief measures. Um, and again, this was really a collective effort. This is not IEC owning this specifically, but um, there was great success in, in preventing uh, a disproportionate economic impact on low income um, folks across the state in the midst of a pandemic. And that's something that we're very proud of. So, Going into um, the panel today and then the format of the public comments, here's just a quick rundown of what the public comment period will look like after we have our panel presentation. So there are various options for you to post uh, your public comment. Um, you can post in the chat to request to speak and then we'll collect a list of people that have um, requested to speak and then we'll call on you to give your five minute um, public comment. And the second option is to write your public comment in the Zoom chat box. Again, um, our uh, intern, uh, Mikhail, will be recording those and making sure she's taking notes on what people are saying there and in um, the spoken public comments. And three, if you're calling um, by phone, uh, please use the raise your hand function, which is star nine. We'll see that you raise your hand and we'll add to the list um, to speak. And then finally, if you don't like Zoom calls, if this isn't your jam, you don't want to speak, totally fine. You can email me at gtaves at illenviro.org and I will record your public comment um, for our database that we're collecting. And finally, just for the format, I've said this a few times, but we'd really like to encourage as many people to uh, participate as possible. If you can try to keep your public comment in the five minute time frame, that would be appreciated. If it goes a little bit over, again, that's okay. Um, we do want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to say their, to have their full say in, um, in crafting our agenda and help in influencing us. So um, yeah, just please keep that in mind for uh, when you do participate. So first, before we dive into the public comment period, we're going to have uh, this really excellent uh, energy town hall panel. So this is the order um, in which we are uh, having the presenters present. So um, first, we have Jennifer Castle from Earth Justice uh, speaking, then we'll have John Delory from Boat Solar, Anne McKibben from Elevate Energy, and finally, Naomi Davis from Blacks and Green. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, um, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jenny Castle, um, who will be doing our first presentation, and we're really looking forward to this. Um, so yeah, Jenny, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, that would be great. Okay, let's see. Uh, will do. I do see host disabled participant screen sharing. We can fix that. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. You should be able to share now. Okay, great. All right. Yeah.
There we go. Um, go back up. There we go. Sorry for the technical diff difficulties, everybody. Um, my name is Jenny Castle. I'm a staff attorney with Earth Justice's Cold Program. As many of you know, we're a relatively new organization to Chicago, opening office about a year ago, and um, have a longstanding cold program with a focus on coal ash work. So um, I'm going to provide you a little bit of an update today about some really amazing legislation we got passed last year and um, a little uh, loophole that we really need some legislative support to change um, to make sure that all the protections we got in place stay there and are meaningful. Um, so let me start with a little bit of background about coal ash. Um, we've known for a long time that coal ash, which is the ash that's left over once you burn coal from coal plants around the country, um, is dangerous. It contains a lot of uh, heavy metals, including lead, mercury, arsenic, uh, boron, chromium, and cadmium, and sort of a big toxic slew of stuff you do not want in your water um, or your air. Um, and it is really, historically, it's been um, stored and disposed of in really unsafe ways. It's been disposed of in um, impoundments, so big old pits in the ground with water um, that are very often right next to lakes or rivers because the coal plants that uh, burn the coal needed a lot of water to cool their equipment. Um, and um, or landfills, which are sort of also pits in the ground but dry, oftentimes those did not come with the modern protections like leachate collection, groundwater protect, groundwater monitoring, or adequate liners. Um, so what you really have is the disaster that in many cases in waiting, is waiting to happen and in other cases already has happened. Um, when Hurricane Florence hit North Carolina in 2018, we saw the collapse of a berm at the Sutton coal plant, uh, ash pond there, which is a Duke plant in North Carolina. Notably, this is not on the coast. This is not, you know, something that looks like it's in, right next to the ocean, and so you would expect it. It was based on all the rain from that hurricane that just um, led the river, the Cape Fear River, to really go way above its banks and, and break through. So you see there the coal ash coming through, which has a devastating impact on, you know, not only folks walking by, anyone that might use that river um, to kayak on or for drinking water, but of course also to wildlife nearby, as you see next door, next to it, um, my colleague Pete, Harrison um, found a turtle that was just utterly covered in coal ash at the site of that collapse. Um, so they also discovered really high arsenic levels in the, in the water near, um, in the Cape Fear River near, near the collapse of that plant. Um, monitoring that has been done of groundwater near coal ash ponds since uh, 2017 has revealed that over 90% of the many hundreds of coal ash ponds there are in this country are polluting groundwater to unsafe levels with the same contaminants that I mentioned before. And uh, coal ash, to be clear, is not only a groundwater contamination problem, it is also very definitely an air pollution problem. This is a very obnoxious example of that. Um, it was a ash dump that was titled Making Money, Having Fun. Um, that was literally the company's name in Bokoshi, Oklahoma to nearby residents and wildlife. Um, the, the particles can be inhaled if they're dry. Um, just like any other particles or particulates, they can lodge in the lungs and exacerbate respiratory ailments. Uh, a major example of the problems and dangers of coal ash dust was at the Tennessee Valley Authority um, Kingston plant where there was a massive spill at the end of 2008. In the last couple of years, there's been a jury verdict of a class action lawsuit by the cleanup workers at the site who, because they were not given, or in part because they were not given adequate cleanup um, gear, personal protective equipment, which is the term I think we're all familiar with now, not to mention, you know, areas where they could go for lunch and other breaks to escape the dust. Uh, many have ended up dying or gotten very sick respiratory ailments. Um, this scourge is not something that Illinois has escaped from. In fact, Illinois is one of the states in the country that has the most coal ash impoundments. The exact number is a little debatable because sometimes they have berms in the middle of them and sometimes they you know, have sort of been out of use for many years, but Illinois EPA currently is estimating there are 73 impoundments in Illinois. And um, if you look at the map on the right of your screen put together by Prairie Rivers Networks, master uh, coal ash worker, uh, or water resources engineer, I should say, Angie Rain, 
uh, who works very closely with us on coal ash matters um, that shows you where they are located throughout Illinois, some at open op operating coal plants or that were operating at the time and have since closed and others at closed coal plants. As you will notice, of course, you know, while air pollution is something that generally gets better, right, when you close a coal plant, coal ash doesn't go away. You continue to have those dumps um, right there. Uh, and many are in, um, in um, excuse me, are in um, environmental justice communities like Joaquin and Peoria. Um, and many of these dumps are truly unsafe. They are leaching out dangerous contaminants because they include, um, they fail to include adequate liners or they have no liner at all or they're located too close to the water table and so risk or already are uh, leaching contaminants into the water because of that groundwater rising up into the ash. Um, one very sort of graphic example of what coal ash pollution looks like is available sadly on the Middle Fork, which is Illinois' only national scenic river. Truly a beautiful river and thanks to Eco Justice Collaborative for these pictures and Andrew Rain, um, again, will provide a model for what coal ash pollution looks like. I think some of these may be pictures from him as well. This is what the middle fork looks like where it's not contaminated by coal ash. This is what it looks like where it is. These are a couple years ago, um, pictures from a couple years ago of the banks of the middle fork of the Vermilion River precisely adjacent to the coal ash impoundment that they're hidden on this site. That is not paint. That is not a five-year-old attempt at psychedelic coloring. Those are all toxic metals leaching out from the riverbank into the water, and as you can see, staining that water a funky rust yellow color, yellowy orange purple. Um, so to move quickly, because I realize I'm getting short on time, um, there was a federal rule passed in 2015 that sets out requirements for coal ash dumps after many years of spills and contamination. Um, it lacks a number of the components that we were able to get into the Illinois law last year, the Coal Ash Pollution Prevention Act, otherwise known as SB9. The 2015 federal rule was not designed as a permitting program. It didn't include any permits. It wasn't until later federal legislation allowing a permitting program or state programs that those became allowable. There is no financial assurance required. That means that polluters need not set aside any money to ensure cleanup or closure are done right. No mandate to compare different methods for closing impoundments. And two different, the two key different methods used are cap in place, as we call it, closure in place, where you basically attempt, you are supposed to dry out the coal ash in the impoundment, remove all the water, and then put a cap on top of it. As you will find out, that is often impossible because the, the impoundments are soaking in groundwater um, that keeps, <laughs> keeps flowing into that coal ash, even with a cap on top of it. Um, and um, hey, hey, Jenny, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Do you, mm -hmm. do you mind if we um, just uh, come to a, a, a conclusion on, on this presentation so we can we can move on to the next speaker? Is that okay? I'm sorry. Yeah, let me take one minute to finish and then I'll Okay, to perfect. Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you. Apologies. No, no problem. Sorry about that. Um, so the main issue is that uh, that we really need to address is that the Illinois law that we passed last year includes a number of important protections that the federal rule doesn't have, including these closure alternatives, financial assurance, public participation and permitting. And it includes a loophole that allows for federally issued permits, US EPA issued permits to stand in for Illinois permits. The problem is those federally issued permits are likely to be far weaker. In fact, are, are going to be far weaker than the protections demanded in the Illinois requirements. And so what we need to see is that that loophole be removed in order to make sure there is no question that all the safeguards we fought for in SB9 are implemented at all the coal ash And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I apologize to, to do that. I just want to make sure we get uh, everybody, um, everybody in here. So, uh, Next, uh, we have uh, John Delury from Vote Solar to give uh, his five-minute uh, presentation. All right, thanks, Gavin. Just pulling up the presentation. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, you are all good. Great. Let me... Well, that gets us part of the way there. We'll, we'll roll with it. So thanks, uh, Gavin, and thanks, IEC, for convening this exciting town hall. I have the great pleasure of walking through what Illinois is looking to accomplish through renewable energy, 
through the renewable portfolio standard, and in particular through programs and subprograms that target ways of improving access and equity within the renewable energy sector writ large. And just by ways of introduction, I, I'm with Vote Solar. We're a nationwide solar advocacy organization. I'm their Midwest director based out of Chicago and spend the bulk of my time here in Illinois working for CEJA, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, for some of the reasons that I'll get into in, in just a minute. Um, so I won't dwell on this. I suspect that everybody on the call knows the stakes and knows why we are pursuing action on climate and frankly, why the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy is a critically important piece of that puzzle. So in absence of federal action and without any federal leadership, the states have become the, the biggest and most important players for advancing the renewable energy economy. The primary way that we do this is by setting ambitious goals for our energy sector to achieve. And most often in many states that, that takes the form of renewable portfolio standard. That's the case here in Illinois. And it was initially begun this, this process of setting goals and working to achieve them was started back in 2001. It was vastly expanded in the Future Energy Jobs Act, which I suspect many of you were involved with passing and pushing. But ultimately what the RPS does is it recognizes that even though renewable energy is cost competitive with fossil fuels, it needs that extra oomph to, to make it deploy at the scale and at the speed which the climate requires. And so this is a way of sort of kickstarting the economic engines and ensuring that things move towards the renewable energy future and away from the fossil fuel past. Again, I know this is review for a number of you, but I just wanted to dip into the history real quick. So the Future Energy Jobs Act was a landmark piece of legislation. IEC played a key role in getting that done, as did, again, many on this call. And it did a number of things. It set a new goal of 25% renewable energy by 2025. And it also created certain programs designed to catalyze increased equity and increased access within the renewable energy space. So one of those programs was the Illinois Solar for All program. And I'll spend probably the bulk of the remainder of my relatively short time talking about some of these programs and why they're so important. And then at the end, close up with why CJA is, is such a key priority for us and why, I, frankly, I think it should be a, a key priority for IEC as it is now. So the Solar for All program, it, it should already be on your radar. If it's not, please go look at it. it it's brilliant. And there aren't many programs like it across the country. It is specifically designed to bring the benefits of solar, uh, whether it's rooftop solar or solar on a church or a, a small nonprofit or even community solar, large solar fields that you can get a subscription to, to those that make 80% or less of area median income. And for those that qualify, they get extreme cost savings, all sorts of benefits. And it also provides this engine of growth for contractors that are graduating from workforce development programs, also created through FIJA. So the only catch is that there is a bit of a disconnect between the anecdotes and the evidence. Uh, this photo on the left is, was just taken two weeks ago. Um, this is a, a couple who lives in that beautiful looking bungalow down in Auburn Gresham. And there's a few different stories all in this photo. The, the solar installer on the roof was a graduate of a FIJA workforce development program. Those solar panels are about to be installed and save them a ton of money, thanks to the Illinois Solar for All program. Uh, there's a cute dog just to spice things up a little bit. And this is a legislator who came down to see what this could look like and what solar looks like in practice. Unfortunately, there is evidence that points that these smaller interventions aren't quite enough and that there's a racial inequity and inequality within solar deployment, even when you account for income. So even when you fa like factor out every other possible variable, there still is a, a racial gap in the deployment of solar. It's not just deployment, it's also the, the workforce itself. So compared to the general workforce, the solar workforce is predominantly uh, stale, male, and pale. Um, it, it's, it's, it's staffed by those that might not represent the communities that we're hoping to see more solar in. 
fortunately, we have a legislative package that is really trying to tip things in the more e equitable direction. Inertia is, is sort of against them. Benefits like this tend to flow towards communities of existing wealth and privilege. Solar tends to snowball. If you see it on your neighbor's roof, it tends to just gather its own, its own momentum. CJA recognizes that and it beefs up some of the existing initiatives and it creates some new programs. So I won't, I just wanted to flash this slide. I, I won't dive into these. I know others on this town hall are going to approach some of these. But in particular, these first two bubbles that you see are designed to approach this problem and this inequality in, in a really comprehensive way. The climate crisis is all encompassing and CJA is a bold and ambitious package to try to get the right jobs and the right projects in the right places. And it's no small feat and it, it merits a, a deeper dive than I have time to do now. So I'm saying most of this just by way of teaser and to say that Illinois is, is at the brink of passing one of the most ambitious and aspirational climate justice legislation in the country, you know, setting it far and ahead, all of its neighbors certainly, and likely some of the usual suspects on the coast. And as it does so, as it sets that 100% clean energy target that Gavin was talking about, it ensures that those benefits flow in an equitable way. That's, I believe, probably already over my five minutes, but I just wanted to add my contact information in case people needed follow-up. And unfortunately, I, I do have to pivot over to another call pretty soon here. And so the good news is there are plenty of other people on this call that I'm sure can help field questions and receive comments uh, along the way. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Sean. Um, really respect you uh, uh, giving the plug there. Um, and thank you for, for doing so. Um, we're going to move now to uh, Ann McKibben from Elevate Energy. And Ann, I will be sending you three minute and one minute warnings. So <laughs> look at your chat if you right. uh, <laughs> have it available. Okay, thanks all. I'm ready. <laughs> all right, let me just share my screen real quick. Uh, Hi, everybody. Can you see my screen? Awesome. Great. Right. Thanks for joining everybody today. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about energy efficiency and sort of the landscape of energy efficiency um, policy in Illinois and some trends. Let's see. How do I make it go? Oh, there we go. Great. So how are we doing in Illinois? Um, we have um, some pretty powerful laws in place for energy efficiency that create programs you may have seen from your utilities if you're a customer of Amer and ComEd, People's NICOR, North Shore Gas. <coughs> Pardon me. On the electric side, our energy efficiency programs to go kind of, and that's because of work we, that we did under the future energy jobs act a few years ago as that's being implemented those programs are getting bigger and bigger every year um, so i would encourage everyone to take advantage of them uh, if you've bought led light bulbs at your local home depot or hardware or your local hardware store you probably already have taken advantage of them and didn't even know it in that the utilities are buying down the price of all those light bulbs so um <laughs> uh, so there's, uh, yeah, so that's a success story. Um, on the other hand, the average Illinois household pays about the same for their gas and electric bills, um, but our gas efficiency programs are lagging behind. The targets are too low, the investment is too low, too low compared to other states that are really leaders and have shown that you can do really robust um, gas efficiency programs. So in that way, there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. Um, and, uh, and a lot of opportunity for improvement. Um, even though we're in a cold climate, a lot of people heat with gas. Uh, insulation is cheap and it does the job. <laughs> There's also constant improvements in technology. Um, also, our industrial customers aren't necessarily participating in efficiency programs across the state, and that's because of something that's in the law. Um, another big way that sort of policy mechanism for improving energy efficiency are building codes. We want all our new buildings and all our buildings that are getting major retrofits um, to be doing, you know, to be built in a way that they're as efficient as possible right from the get-go. We don't want to build buildings that are immediately obsolete. Um, 
In Illinois, our state, we have statewide residential and commercial building codes that are pretty good. Um, the city of Chicago is allowed to, uh, can do better. They're, everybody has to hit the statewide floor. Chicago can choose to go above and beyond, and they have chosen to do that, which is great. Um, but there are other municipalities who could probably also do better. And so that's an area of, of Im for impro potential improvement too, is to allow those municipalities to go above and beyond the statewide codes, which I, like I say, are pretty good, but they're not like super industry state super industry leading um, codes, but they're, they're good standards. Um, and then lastly, I just should say that our utility programs and other programs, you know, it's really import important that they target low income households. Um, utilities are currently, or investor owned utilities are currently investing more in those programs than they're required to by law, which is a great thing. And um, we wanna make sure that continues. Um, and there are some programs within that portfolio of uh, low income uh, efficiency programs that could probably be better resourced or better coordinated with solar and other resources as well. So we're doing pretty well there, but there's always room for improvement when you're trying to improve equity. So some strategies uh, that could be put in place, and these are just you know some ideas, there are other ideas out there, would love to hear from you about your favorites. Um, <laughs> for improving if Illinois' efficiency, of course there's Lots of stuff in the Clean Energy Jobs Act that addresses efficiency, especially that gas efficiency portion. We'd like to do the gas efficiency, what we did to electric efficiency back with the Future Energy Jobs Act, which would make, is to make those gas efficiency programs some of the best in the country. We would really like to see that. We'd also like to see that continued focus on investment in low-income communities. Our Electric and Gas Regulatory Commission, the Illinois Commerce Commission, is in charge of ensuring robust compliance and ensuring that low income programs are managed to be successful. We wanna make sure that continues. And there's plenty of room for grassroots advocacy. It's gonna be critical to passing CJ and all the efficiency components that are in it. Also, it's really hard to, to uh, you know, we don't have a lot of policy levers with rural electric co-ops and municipal utilities. So a grassroots advocacy can be very helpful there. If you are in rural electric co-op or municipal utility territory, I would encourage you to run for the board um, because they govern the utility and uh, they need folks who are really interested in clean energy. So I will just leave my contact info. Oops, my sharing has stopped. Awesome. Well, you will have my contact info. If you have any questions that don't get brought up or anything, please let me know. Thanks. And you are a champion. Five minutes on the dot. Much respect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we are going to move on to our final panelist um, and then open it up for public comment after that. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Naomi Davis from Blacks and Green. So Naomi, uh, take it away. Hi, great. Are you um, letting me share my screen? You should have access to it, just the green button on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Share. Hi, everybody. I got to say that um, my friends at um, Elevate and uh, Vote are, um, are just always a joy to be with. And I am grateful for the chance to be on a program with them uh, to bring uh, the Blacks and Green perspective on equity and workforce. So here we go. I um, am going to uh, take a little bit of a different approach um, and I'm moving this uh, screen around a little bit so that I can see my screen best. The, uh, the idea that um, there is a problem in America with equity has never been um, more apparent. It's never been more of a conversation. And um, I, my goal today is to, to talk very quickly about some specific things that can be done, sh should be done, and that Blacks and Green is doing, but also to make sure that you understand a little bit more of the context. So uh, at Blacks and Green, we are looking at how we can create an economy. Economy is full of all kinds of transactions. So the green economy writ large, 
clean energy economy in very tactical and practical ways. And that means that black people get to be the ones receiving the finance. We're designing, directing, representing, and benefiting from these uh, economic development measures. And when we say measure, we really literally mean measure. That means uh, increase in household income, ownership of the local businesses and the land, um, and in responding to the climate crisis that we are cultivating what we at Blacks and Green call the sustainable square mile. It's a local living economy. This is not a new concept. Uh, as a greenhouse gas reduction strategy, where neighbor dollars circulate. And that's where we come into that economy piece. The supply chain, the vendors of a, of a, a, to a service area are also from that service area. So, uh, let me see. So we authored and teach the eight principles of green village building. We won't go into them in depth, but it is a system for uh, creating these spaces that we call the sustainable square mile. And I'll just bring your attention here to the one that's education because it factors very, uh, very fundamentally into the Clean Energy Jobs Act uh, that we're pushing right now. Uh, you'll see that each village fosters lifelong learning through hubs which are epicenters for green training, development, and lifestyle trans transformation. This was written back in between 2000 and 2003, so it's been a long time coming. And we're saying in the context of this green village building that if Chicago would be a city of villages where every household could walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, and walk to play, that's what we're talking about. And here in our um, walkable village where we live and work, we are a national network, but we're talking about how do we create a green economy? How do we create a clean energy economy right here in the sustainable square mile of West Woodlawn? And this is our hub in the hood, the green living room on Cottage Grove. We call it the Obama presidential district. We're right uh, beneath the University of Chicago, east uh, west of where the um, uh, Obama Presidential Center is coming, and uh, these are examples of the kind of work uh, that we're uh, engaged in. You can see right now I've got my Big Clean Power t-shirt on, and <laughs> that means that we are building a worker-owned social mission enterprise offering a full spectrum of energy services, including weatherization, efficiency, solar sales, and a PV panel assembly plant that we've had uh, in the process for the last several years. A Green Power Alliance is, 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 is a subset, is an, one of the programs of Blacks and Green where we meet every Monday night and we're talking about workforce education and placement and strategy and advocacy and uh, tracking and uh, project finance. We have um, recently been the beneficiary of a ComEd Energy Efficiency Innovation Award which has allowed us to finance our green hub in the hood, our green living room. Everybody who's been here wants a green living room for their neighborhood. It's part of our overall strategy that we should be able to have places in the black community where we can come get our green on, get uh, workforce training and development that we do right here on site, get plugged into the benefits of solar, how we can get it installed on our rooftops at no cost to the Illinois Solar for All, and thus and so. So we're looking to expand our skill group and expand the trade skill groups of our vendors in our neighborhood by training and engaging them in the opportunities of the new green economy is what we do all day, every day. And as a correlate to that, increasing household income by decreasing the utility burden that households have to uh, experience uh, in a disproportionate way in the black community. These are all fundamental parts of what we do. So equity, um, and this is just gonna dip down a little bit deeper because we throw the word around. Uh, I'm of a certain age where I can uh, say, I can personally give testimony of how the civil rights era and the movement was pimped and depleted. And we don't wanna see that kind of thing happen for the next 50 years. We're looking to level the playing fields, level the playing field. So who decides, uh, whose table is it? These are, these are uh, questions in the subtext. 
counting who gets paid. We have to follow the money. Um, uh, the leveling the playing field is a very practical and tactical uh, process, uh, managing what measures and targeting the harms. So just very briefly, that means um, you don't invite me to your table and get satisfied. It's not your table after all. Um, it means that uh, what color is the supply chain? Um, if you understand that um, black communities want to have black vendors serving uh, their uh, clean energy needs, you'll understand that there's a whole plethora of different kinds of businesses that need to be powered up literally and figuratively. Um, we want to understand uh, in an economic way. I mean, Fiji was a $700 million allocation. Um, there was a very small portion allocated to, um, uh, to low-income communities, and we were very glad to get it. We're fighting for more in the Clean Energy Jobs Act version, and that means that we're looking to get uh, higher allocations more frequently and um, more upfront. The, this, this makes just basic bottom, sen bottom line sense when you're looking at outcomes. We're very outcome oriented in the energy field. That means we're looking at metrics and what we haven't really managed is how we are gonna actually tactically build up these workforce numbers. If African-Americans are 15.3% of the Illinois population, how do we actually move the needle um, because as great and as wonderful as the, um, as the Future Energy Jobs Act was, uh, uh, it, 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 it's designed to target the intentional damage, uh, but, it's, it, but it falls short in actually moving the needle uh, to the hundreds of thousands of clean energy jobs, how many of those uh, are going to be coming to the black community. So in conclusion, you really have to do the math. You have to do the numbers. You have to solve for disparity. When you're tracking the outcomes, you wanna be able to look at what percentage of your payroll by dollar amount and by employee count have been from the black community. Uh, and of course, when I say black, I mean uh, black and brown and I am blacks and green. So I don't apologize for that, but I want you to understand that this, this, is, this is something that Melody Hobson, the CEO, I believe her title is, of Aerial Capital, a very important financial institution in the black community, married George Lucas of Star Wars fame, was on the news the other night saying, look, guys who are asked to make these changes are champions. They're used to winning. They understand numbers. They understand setting goals and they understand meeting them. They understand the value of meeting them and how to meet them. And so it's not an excuse that suddenly when it comes to equity, when suddenly it comes to hiring black people, that we get all fudgy and we get all um, goosey about how we can possibly achieve that. We can put a man into deep space and return him safely. You can have equity and inclusion in your workforce. Um, relatedly, um, single family homes getting these Illinois solar for all installations are extremely important right now. We've got a lot of money just sitting on the table, but if you're going to require credit applications and a 650 credit score, these are the kinds of things that are going to minimize the ability of African American people to participate in the new clean energy economy. And lastly, I just want to invite everybody tonight uh, between 6 and 8 p.m. Uh, the uh, Black Chicago Water Council is having our monthly meeting and um, all are invited. You can, you can find a, um, an invitation um, on our website, which is blacksandgreen.org. And um, if you have questions about how to develop um, a workforce in an equitable way. We're, we're present at any given time to, to support that process. And let me just say that trainees must receive a living wage during the time they're being trained. You cannot expect people to leave a job or forgo a job and enter a training program when there's so much emergency money floating around and billionaires are getting millions 
to you cannot expect um, the people from the least privileged neighborhoods to join a workforce training program where they're getting $250 every two weeks and expect it to stay the course. We believe that is a fundamental change that needs to be made in the legislation. And we believe that the length of the training programs need to be extended. Uh, and if the end result is that um, the capacity of trade vendors in our organization is built so that they're able to provide the solar, provide the energy efficiency, provide the weatherization to the customers in their neighborhoods and beyond, then we will have actually achieved equity. Thanks so much, Naomi. Um, that was really, really informative. And uh, yeah, please attend if you can. It looks like a great event. All right, so um, we're gonna move into the uh, public comment period um, at this time. I um, am going to be a little strict on the time um, for each comment. Um, and again, if you have multiple comments or you have more information to share, please email me. I will share my uh, email in the chat box. Um, and then you can also just post in the chat box like a lot of people have been doing right now. So um, if you would like to give a public comment right now, please put uh, your, your name down or just an indicator that you would like to speak um, in the chat box and I'll give people a minute or two uh, to do so. Okay, uh, Ben, why don't you kick it off for us? Hi, thank you so much for uh, allowing me the time to speak. Uh, first off, my name is Ben Isabel. I work for, uh, I'm a policy and budget analyst for the Illinois State Senate Democratic Caucus. Um, just a disclaimer, the opinions are my own and not uh, ones of the Democratic Caucus, and um, I am here not on state time, on my own time. So just a disclaimer. Um, so yeah, so I, I think that um, I really appreciate all the work that the advocates and the Illinois Environmental Council is doing, especially towards CJA. I think that CJA will open the door to a lot of subsequent legislation, which I think um, will um, be very much needed for our state. Um, one thing, um, I think should be looked at in the future is um, CJ is really um, comprehensive and great towards climate mitigation strategies. Um, I think that we could also include some climate adaptation strategies in the future. I think that one thing that goes especially well with energy is um, grid resilience. Um, we even if we did were able to um, shut off all our emissions now, the planet will still inevitably heat up uh, for a good time. So I think grid resilience goes really well within that. And uh, I think that um, we as a state should be promoting microgrid systems. I think that uh, we have uh, 15 microgrid systems currently in use. Uh, we were the best in the Midwest for that so far, but um, that will, that you can add uh, equity aspects into that. You can, uh, you know, concentrate it in minority communities. Um, and microgrids, um, you know, can also go into the, um, I think CJA goes a long way with helping with energy efficiency and uh, FIJA and CJA especially um, helped with community so uh, solar, which is, I think is the first sort of step towards promoting microgrids, but I think that that is a great way forward just to make sure that our, you know, as our planet does inevitably heat up a little bit more, even if we do take mitigation steps, that we have, you know, something to fall back on and something to make sure that we are making sure that our, you know, renewable energy systems we build out are stable and that we build stable um, grid systems. Thank you, that's all I had to say. Great, thank you so much, Ben. Um... If you would like uh, more information on IEC's um, adaptation strategy, please email me and I, I would love to uh, talk about that more. Next we have, um, oh geez, I had uh, Stephen and I do not know how to pronounce your last name, apologies, but um, Stephen, go ahead.
unmute. Okay. You should nope, you there you are. You're good. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I, I mentioned earlier in a um, email that there is now charging available through lampposts for electric cars, which is a great way to make it available to a lot of people that are parking in apartment buildings or in homes, townhomes that don't have garages. And uh, I think that's probably the biggest thing that's keeping a lot of people from buying electric cars is the availability and ease of charging. The other thing that I just saw today on uh, a Now You Know YouTube video was having charging available through parking meters. And combine them into one, both a parking meter and a charging station. So I thought that was a great unique idea to, you know, make it a lot easier to get charging and pay for it at the same time. Those are my comments. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, very interesting discussions going on about um, electric vehicle charging uh, across the state and IEC has been involved in a lot of those discussions as well as in crafting um, electric vehicle charging uh, provisions within the Clean Energy Jobs Act. So uh, if you would like to uh, follow up with me about some of those provisions, I'd be happy to speak to them. Yeah, charging on toll roads would be huge. Mm. So um, next, we're going to move to uh, George Tully. Um, if just make sure you're not on mute, and um, yeah, open up the floor to you. Great, thank you, and thank you for hosting the town hall. This has been uh, fantastic and, and great hearing so many ideas. Um, two comments and then one question. Uh, one, I, I think um, a very difficult logistical problem the city and state are going to face is electrifying homes and buildings. Um, it's, it's more than just popping in an electric radiator, or electric furnace. You have to upgrade the electrical system. So I think it makes sense now to start figuring out from a legislative perspective how, where those funds are going to come from and, and how that's going to roll out. Because, you know, if we need to be 100% emission free in the near future, uh, we can't have gas. Um, uh, Two, I think there's a great opportunity for condo and apartment buildings to utilize solar. There are some logistical problems with how you divide that up, um, but I think there are some potentially, uh, I think it, there are just so many roofs out there that could generate and, and cover a lot of those buildings usage, on, especially on the residential side. Um, third, just general question, I've been, it's been kind of exciting to see uh, the effort to uh, make ComEd uh, municipal owned. And I was curious just to get feedback if, if, if that one, I have no idea how feasible that is, but two, you know, does ComEd being municipal owned rather than it, you know, currently through Exelon, um, which gives us the better route to, to decarbonizing it faster? I suspect municipal does, um, that we have kind of more direct leverage, but I also and an outsider that has no, that doesn't know. So I would be curious what on kind of like the nitty gritty of how that transition would look if ComEd did go municipal, um, if that would give us kind of more levers to decarbonize our energy mix um, quicker. Um, thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, George. Um, I will just give a very, very brief response because I really want to focus on the input from um, the folks on the call. Um, just candidly, IEC is um, only somewhat involved in the, uh, in the conversations um, that, that you just discussed about, uh, the, about municipal control um, over uh, ComEd and uh, what that would entail. But um, there are folks who have been working on this a lot that are uh, very close partners. And I'd be happy to connect you um, with them. Uh, given that, I think that uh, Chicago um, has a more explicit focus on decarbonization than maybe uh, ComEd, the utility, uh, does. So you might be onto something there. But uh, yes, happy to connect you with um, folks who really ex who are um, experts in that specific field and are, are really engaged on the topic. Um, 
And yeah, again, I'm posting my email several times here, but please email me with any other follow-up questions um, that you might have, and I would, I'd be happy to uh, include them. So I'm seeing, um, I haven't seen anybody else requesting to speak, um, but I will do a quick um, response to several of these questions. There's been some political questions about CJA. Um, so just as another note, we are aiming for uh, the fall veto session vote on CJA. It's been very exciting. New polling about um, the public support for CJA specifically. We sh we're showing that 82% of people statewide are in support of passing CJA right now. Um, and that's a plurality among um, conservative, independent, and democratic voters across the state, um, which is really exciting. So while um, it may seem a bit optimistic to say that CJO will be included in some kind of recovery package that's proposed in the fall, we're actually uh, pretty confident that um, we're going to get something done and we're going to push as hard as we can to make sure that reality uh, exists. So just a quick note about the, uh, the politics of the situation. So I'm gonna leave the uh, chat open here again for another minute or two. If anybody would like to speak, please post um, your name uh, so we can record your public comment. So noting a few uh, questions about um, the public comments themselves, there is um, not a, an official deadline. Um, I'm just gonna open the channel to whoever would like to uh, discuss these, um, uh, discuss the issues further. Um, I'm happy to respond to anyone and everyone uh, for um, as long as necessary. Uh, we just wanna make sure that your uh, public comments are recorded and that you as the public are able to help draft uh, and shape our agenda going forward. Um, okay, noting that no one is um, uh, requesting to speak, we can go into a couple short uh, responses to some of the, uh, the questions here. And then if um, folks don't have any more to, uh, to add, uh, we, can, uh, we can end this call. Um, and yeah, so, um, Looking at some of the questions, okay, we've seen a couple questions about adaptation now. Uh, what's really exciting in the climate adaptation world for, uh, for IEC and for a lot of our partners, um, we have um, uh, an explicit focus on working uh, on adaptation um, legislation and other advocacy in this coming year. We recognize the importance especially of uh, natural solutions to uh, climate change, and that's definitely going to be something that we're looking at as an organization. Um, it's really important that we're looking at all avenues of both mitigation and adaptation when it comes to climate change, recognizing, you know, the severity of the, um, of, of the climate crisis itself. So uh, we've uh, been working with Open Lands uh, uh, within the Clean Jobs Coalition to see um, what uh, information they can provide to, to help guide us. And there's a lot of really exciting work going on there. So I'm also noting some requests for more information on the uh, Solar Bill of Rights and on our EV legislation. Again, I'm gonna inquire those um, that have specific requests for information on the legislation to email me. Um, I'm gonna post that uh, one more time. But um, yes, please email me there uh, and then <laughs> Um, I can send you um, the uh, text from the bills and summaries and information um, to connect you to those who are uh, tied into some specific issues. All right. Um, I'm going to give a last call for uh, comments here. Um, I'm just going to give it another minute. Uh, please post uh, whatever you'd like in the chat box so that we can record it 
And again, I'm gonna share my email one more time. All right, folks, it does look like uh, uh, nobody else uh, would like to speak, which is fine. Um, so we'd like to thank you for attending the session today. Uh, the comments that I've been reading, the ones that we responded to and um, uh, what others have been noting are very important to us. Um, again, this session is going to help us uh, determine our legislative and advocacy priorities for uh, the coming year. So, um, we really appreciate everybody's input and the thoughtful uh, responses that we received. Uh, to the panelists, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise and your knowledge uh, and your passion with everybody here. It is much appreciated. Uh, for everybody else, enjoy uh, your afternoon. And again, please reach out to me with any and all questions. I am happy to respond and get you connected to folks um, who might have even more information than I do. All right, so with that, uh, we're gonna end this meeting. So thank you all very much and have a nice day.